thank you all very, very much for coming out. Um, I'm not sure how quite to take that bit about the, uh, if anybody knows the history more than she does. I was just looking at my crow's feet and thinking, all right, that's me. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you for everything you do. I have met many of you uh, starting um, at the Animal Rights Conference and in the center and everybody everywhere else. And, I'm very, very impressed. I watch what DXE does and my heart sings because that is real activism and it's marvelous. So thank you. Um, I want to start with a little video because I don't know if any of you have seen or heard Nick Cave's song, Breathless Without You. We did something with Iggy Pop, who is a wonderful fella, uh, with Nick Cave's song. And when I heard it, I thought you should make him an honorary DXE member. So here it is. very well. So let me start with an illustration of progress. Last month it was Fashion Week all over Paris and the UK. But in the UK the British fashion industry warned people who were coming to the fashion shows not to wear fur and they said don't even wear faux fur because the PETA protesters are out there. <laughs> so when people got to the fashion show we showed them this. A little bit different, moving on up. So, as Wayne said, what I want to do is go back in time a bit, because history is a very great teacher if we allow it to be a teacher, especially when it comes to the power of activism in all social movements. I was in Jerusalem at the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, and there they have something on the wall that says, remember the past, but use it to shape the future. And that's really what we need to do. In the 1960s and 70s, we had basically a social revolution. And it was against all forms of social injustice that we understood at the time. Like other movements, the women's movement had certainly come apace. I mean, women did have the right to vote by that time, and they weren't considered property. But there were still very bad things that were happening for women, unjust things. It was normal for wives to have to obey their husbands. And it was normal for a boss to ask his secretary to sit on his lap. That was normal. Now, I know all these things go on today. You know, we have the Harvey Weinstein thing going on now. But back then, it was just what happened, and nobody could say a peep about it. So women then said, I've had enough of that. 
And what they did was they very boldly, which seems silly now, wore pantsuits to work, which wasn't considered to be the thing to do. Or they took off all their clothes, they stripped down to shock men and to say, look, it's my body and you don't get to say what I do with it. I can do anything that I want with it. It belongs to me. Now, I know today there are feminists who object to this or find it silly, and then there are people like Pussy Riot who don't, and then there are people like me who come from those early line of feminists for which it was very liberating to just say, I'm not going to cover my knees or any other part of me. Here I am. And because of such up... <laughs> because of these uppity women, as we were called them, the unbelievable happened. It stopped being acceptable. It stopped being normal for men to treat women as if they were handmaidens. At about the same time, people also took to the streets to protest the Vietnam War. And they called the Vietnam War unjust and racist. And Martin Luther King was told by his followers to stay away from this. They said to him, you know, stick to black issues. Don't get embroiled in fighting or protesting the Vietnam War. But Martin Luther King was a wonderful man. And he didn't listen. And he issued those wonderful words that we all know and use today, which is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He knew that we don't live in a single issue society and he wasn't having any of it. We're all in this together. One principle to fight injustice. So Martin Luther King went out and he protests and his supporters joined him and they could say this. And the protesters grew into a movement, a massive movement with thousands and thousands of people on the National Mall, people refusing to go to war. And because of that agitation, something wonderful and something unbelievable happened. The United States pulled out of Vietnam. This is a huge war that was ended. The power of the people to stop a massive war. Just last month, I joined the March for Animal Rights in Israel, in Tel Aviv. <laughs> 30,000 people, and I hope you get 30,000 people tomorrow, you never know. 30,000 people filling the streets, and if you took a drone and you flew over them, you could see animal rights people as far as the eye could see. It was unbelievable, and it reminded me of the pictures of the protests for women's rights and the protests to end the Vietnam War, and now it's our time, it's Animal Rights March time. <laughs> John Lennon and Yoko Ono were very big, and they released the song Imagine, which I imagine you all know. <laughs> and if you listen to the lyrics of Imagine, it says, you know, don't use religion to justify hate. Be against nationalism, this pettiness of how small we are, how narrow we can make our sphere of concern. Be against materialism. Do what Gandhi and others have said. Give away what you have, what you don't need. It was a plea for inclusion for all. And it said this, imagine a world without greed, without hunger, without wars based on differences in where we're from or what we look like. Imagine we are all in this together. And we were. We protested together. It was very unified and wonderful, no matter what our other differences. John Lennon and Yoko Ono didn't get the whole thing. They still had a closet full of fur, but that would come later. So at the very same time, or roughly, Vivian Westwood, who was the queen of punk fashion and of radical everything, sold a shirt that read, Get a Life. And we thought, actually, that's perfect. Because Vivian was saying something even better 
than imagine a world without this bad thing and that bad thing. She was saying, don't just sit there and imagine. Get up, get a life, and do it. Just do things and change the world. And that's the only way that a movement is successful. Ain't nothing gonna change if you don't try to change it. You know, people always say to us at PETA, oh, you can't say that, or you can't do that. If you can't say something until people already understand the idea, you will never say it. So pushing the envelope, to me, is an obligation that we have to say the unpopular thing if you believe that it's right. <laughs> quirk of fate, we are very lucky not to be the other animals that I'm just going to um, show you a little glimpse of. Many of you know what I'm going to show you, but if you wish to uh, look down or close your eyes, I understand. We can only cry so much. But I ask people to look because the investigators are wonderful people and they had to stand there and they had to feel they were betraying the animals, that they didn't say anything. They didn't do anything to stop it. They just carried on filming, and that's a huge burden on them. They couldn't look away, and they couldn't walk away. And worse, of course, is the animals, is that they don't only look at it. They go through it over and over again. So I'm just going to give you just the tiniest glimpse we have dog leather. Everybody knows dog meat? We went to a dog leather factory in China. These dogs are made into gloves that are sold in this country. That's enough. Sheep. We went into every shearing shed on every continent except Antarctica. The men are on amphetamines. They cut them to shreds. They sew them up with dental floss. They hit them with the clippers. They punch them with their fists. They turn their necks around and they even break them. Snakes, skinned alive, because who cares about a snake? Why would you even bother to put a snake out of their misery or to re render a snake unconscious? And some of them are blown up with water to stretch the skin so it makes a nicer belt or a nicer pair of shoes. Fur, everybody knows or they should. That's anal electrocution. They also do vaginal electrocution. No one can have a pom-pom made of fur on their purse or a stupid bit of fur collar. Elephants. We know all about elephants in the circus. This is in India where we're getting them out of the temples. This is poor old Sundar being told what he has to do. The strength, the might of these elephants and that they are abused to that extent. Chickens, the ubiquitous animal for the sandwich and the salad, just thrown into a cage, breaking wings and breaking legs. And of course, the mother cow, who adores her baby with all her heart. And this big lumbering beast watches the man cart the baby away. And all she can do is just cry and rape where this last image is rape. This is the dairy cow. The man sticks his hand up into her rectum as far as he can go and then inserts a syringe so that he can find um, her uterus. This is what farmers call a rape rack. So when people say they don't kill the cows for dairy, do they? Well, yes, of course they do. There's no retirement home for them. But first, they rape them. So what we've just seen is oppression, it's discrimination, it's bias, it's prejudice, it's disrespect, and it's animal enslavement. And there is nothing else that you can call it. And we mustn't be afraid to call it that. None of these things just occur to human beings that is a supremacist thought when people say, oh, you can't do that. You can't compare the cow. Yes, you can compare the cow. Yes, you can. <laughs> the 
The philosopher Jeremy Bentham wrote, it matters not if they can reason or if they can speak, it matters only if they can suffer. But they can reason and they can speak. He didn't know that then. I mean, the average dog in your home can understand 200 words without you teaching them one. And yet show me a human being that knows one word of dog or of dolphin or of duck or of anything, any of the animal languages. And they not only try so hard because they must to understand our language, but they also have their own diverse languages that we're often deaf to. People say animals can't speak. Of course they can speak. Human beings can't hear. I'm prejudiced in a different way. I happen to think that all animals are beautiful. I remember once I watched a sea slug like this. There she is gliding around so gently, so beautifully, like a ballerina or an opera singer, looking for a little morsel to eat in her little black robes. I mean, how gentle and gorgeous is she? I've held rats in my arms that have been liberated from laboratories, and they smell like roses. They're so sweet. You know, James Cagney was wrong when he said, you dirty rat. There's nothing dirty about a rat unless people keep them in an unsanitary little shoebox in a laboratory, probably somewhere in this very building. And rats are so despised that I have to show you a bonus picture of a mother rat with her baby. <laughs> Many of you may know Dr. Barnard, who is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's a wonderful man. He rescued a rat, I don't know if you know this, from his psychology class when he was in medical school. And he wrote a story that I love called A Lesson in Animal Rights Weighed Less Than a Pound. Because that rat set him on his trail to understanding who animals are. He called that little rat Ratsky. And the little rat, he said, was very particular. She didn't like things mixed up. So if he had a glass of ice water, she would get upset and she would come up and she would separate the ice from the water. <laughs> and if he was lying on his bed and he was trying to study so he could be the doctor he is today, Ratsky would run up his chest and bite him on the nose and run away <laughs> and say, come play, what are you doing, come and play. So he said, in the lab, she had just been a big white blob in a dirty cage. She was fit only to have her eardrums pierced with a stereotaxic device that was going to be screwed into her head. But at home, she showed me that she was a real parson. So when I use the term parson, yeah. Person, I, I try to be very careful because to me a person isn't a human being. A person is a personality and they are all persons. We happen to be here humans. So the chickens I've rescued um, are each different. I noticed their personalities. Some of them would play ball with a piece of melon if you gave it to them. Some were very shy. Some would worry about their personal appearance. I would think if there had been selfies then, they would have been taking them. Um, they, are, they are something, not so. <laughs> they are someone, not something. This is Naruto, and you may remember Naruto. We sued so that instead of being seen as property, he could own property. We did. <laughs> He's obviously very clever, very perceptive, and watched all these things. Um, but we didn't win the lawsuit. And as somebody says to me, you know, you throw down gravel, you throw down gravel, one day somebody comes along and paves the road. So Naruto is part of the gravel for animal rights. But what did happen as a result of this lawsuit is that now we have wildlife photographers coming forward 
including the settlement, was this wildlife photographer who, whose camera Naruto used. And they are now, for the first time ever, donating 25% of the money they make from the photographs of wildlife to wildlife. <laughs> On personalities, unpopular animals, I remember watching in absolute awe as we um, rescued a cobra from a mob in India who were going to stone her to death. And we got her into a big jar, and they, they go in, you close the lid, and we took her out to a field, and we opened the jar for her to go away. And what she did is she stood up, just like this, absolutely tall, and dignified, and she looked at us all, and she assessed us. She tried to figure out what we were doing and whether we would hurt her. And then with great dignity and aplomb, she turned and walked away. And I thought, that's a snake. I mean, if you can see that in a snake, what can't you see? All animals just, to me, they radiate intelligence. And they have exactly the same emotions that we do. One morning, a long time ago, I put the light on in my kitchen. And I went in, and a cockroach just scuttled across the counter. And I went after him. This is a long time ago. And he ran and hid behind a jar. And I finally I found him, and I could just imagine he was up against the edge of the jar like this, going, ah, ah, I hope she doesn't find me. And I thought, what a terrible indictment that an, an animal this big has the intellect, the understanding to know that this big lummox who just came into the kitchen and put on the light is a threat. What an indictment of the human race that is. What a threat he was. None at all. <laughs> Octopuses now appearing on menus. Octopuses carry coconut shells to use as portable hiding places. See, he's got two. He's carrying them around there. And when he thinks a predator is coming, he'll lift up the sides and he'll go inside and hide. Crows use sticks to retrieve food. And they actually drop weights into uh, water containers so that food will rise to the top. Hugely intelligent. Cows shed tears, just as humans do. Monkeys in a laboratory refuse to pull a chain to access food. You know this study. Even so that if they took that food, if they pressed that chain, a monkey in an adjoining cage would get an electric shock. And many of them chose to starve before they would pull that uh, lever. One monkey went for 11 days without eating something rather than shock the monkey in the next cage. How much more ethics did they have than the people who designed that hideous experiment? And we have stopped a lot of experiments. There are many, many more to stop. But last year, we stopped that hideous infant monkey deprivation experiment funded by the National Institutes of Health. And I will tell you this, is that we do not say, don't use monkeys, but we'll turn away if you use mice or rats. No, you just stop using animals altogether. That's what you need to do. Animals, including the poor fish, understand cause and effect relationships. They solve problems. They exhibit long-term memory. A fish, it's been shown, can remember an escape route that they chose if they, were caught, if they were caught in a net and they had to find a way out for seven years after the event itself. And they can replicate that if they're caught again. They show empathy. And that bats show empathy. Bats will bring food to an ailing bat who can't go out to forage for themselves. And animals will even show empathy to human beings. God help them, I don't know why. But we've got pigs who save children from lakes, and dogs who save, and birds who save 
people, human beings, from fires in their home. If a sheep is placed in a room, in a laboratory, their hearts start pounding and they feel very afraid. But if someone comes in and puts a photograph of another sheep on the wall, their heart rate goes down. It's a comfort to them. A mouse's pulse quickens and their hearts race and their adrenaline surges if they just see the laboratory door handle turning because they've never had a good experience with anybody who has come in the room. And I can tell you from being inside slaughterhouses, which I have been for chickens, for cows, for horses, and for dogs in Taiwan who are made into soup, that all animals get wide-eyed, all animals' hearts race, and all animals panic when they just smell what's coming. We have lost that ability, but they have not. It's so much more fearful for them. Pain is one thing, fear is another, and I think fear is every bit as nasty, and there is nobody who can comfort them and tell them it'll be all right. In Virginia some years ago, this is a happy story, a pregnant cow, and I know there was just a, a bull who escaped from the slaughterhouse in New York again, yes. But in Virginia, you may not know this, it's a stopping point for dairy cows to be shipped to South America. Herds of dairy cows are shipped by boat. And one year, um, a pregnant dairy cow was on board this ship going to Venezuela, and she could sense that something was very wrong here. And she pushed her way through the herd to the railing, broke through the railing, jumped in the river, and swam to an island in the James River. And she hid out. She's, I mean, not small and pregnant, and she hid out for three days. And we said, if you ever find her, we will take her in. And after three days, they did find her, but they gave her to us. We called her Ida Bell. She had her son, Jimmy, and they lived happily ever after because she escaped. <laughs> Animals know when they're powerless against someone who's more powerful. And what happens to them is that their teeth chatter, they shiver, they cower, they tuck their tails under, they scrunch themselves up, they try to become invisible, they keep quiet, and they urinate on themselves. I don't know if anybody has ever done that out of fear. I did. I was mugged in Washington, D.C., and I thought I was going to die, and I did that, so I know what that's about. And animals think. One of my favorite stories is about um, a botanist, this is true in Asia, who had trained a little monkey he kept on a, uh, a string to go up into trees and get exotic flowers for his collection. And one day he was walking along with a sheer cliff drop on one side and he spotted an orchid he'd never seen before growing down the side of the cliff. And so he directed, he gave the command to the monkey to go down this sheer cliff and pick the flower. And the monkey just looked at him. And he gave the command again, go down the sheer cliff and get the flower. And the monkey looked at him. And the monkey wasn't going. And he gave the command a third time. And the monkey leaned over and got hold of the vine the flower was growing on and pulled it up, took the flower off, and gave it to the botanist. <laughs> Here are two other animals just showing how smart they are. A seagull. Fully aware of the cat. Oh my god. <laughs> but wait, there's something left. And here's another 
another one. This is one of my other favorites. Persistence Cave. Dr. Philip Lowe is one of a very prominent group of scientists who signed the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. I'm sure you've heard it. And the Consciousness Declaration declares humans are not unique in any ways that matter. According to this panel, this august panel, non-human animals possess the same neurological substrates that human beings have. There is no scientific validity to the notion that only humans are conscious. There is nothing in the brain to suggest it. We are sacrificing, his word, about 70 billion animals per year just for the meat, dairy, and egg industries alone. But these are complex brains that we are destroying. These are scientists finally speaking out for animal rights. And please, God, don't let anybody tell you that animals are as smart as human children. <laughs> what human child of a few weeks of age or a few months of age could do what a sparrow does, who watches you when you're eating outside watches if you throw a crumb, the trajectory of that piece of food swoops down, has it in a second, and moves off somewhere else to eat it. No human child of six months or a year could do that. And what human child of six or eight months could do what a cow does, who watches how to open a gate with multiple latches and then does it herself. With her tongue. So I would say they based it. That was a cow who's also operating a water pump, having watched somebody do that. So not all of us grew up vegan. Even those of us who loved animals dearly, as I did when I was growing up which is why we have to tell people things. I am eternally grateful for everybody who told me things. And it took a while, because I was a slow learner. I think I was really thick. When I was 19, I had my first fur coat. When I was 21, I got a call. I was a cruelty officer. And I went behind a convenience store where some teenagers had set steel traps. They're very cheap and they set them out in the woods, and two animals had been caught, a squirrel who was dead, and a fox who was still alive, his eyes as big as saucers, in absolute agony. And we managed to get that um, fox out, and had his leg amputated, and he was rehabilitated, but always was staying in the sanctuary. That is what opened my eyes to what was wrong with fur. If only someone had come up to me and said, what are you thinking about? You think you care about animals? Do you know where your coat came from? Do you know what happens to animals? So now I say we should never, ever miss an opportunity to educate everybody about what they're wearing. I stopped wearing fur, but I was still eating all the animals. My father and I basically ate our way through the animal kingdom. Um, one day I went to a farm, and the people had moved away. They had left all the animals there. The animals were dead except for one little pig. And this little pig was so desperate, I was able to carry him out to the water pump. And I pumped water for him and held it in my hands, cupped hands. And then I had to keep holding his neck up because he was so weak. And he made these little grunting sounds. 
of just being so grateful to finally have something to drink. I sent him off to the vets. And this is a long, long time ago, before the age of microwave ovens. And I thought to myself, I'm really hungry. As I was driving home, I wonder what I have that I could eat for dinner. And suddenly I remembered that I had defrosted the pork chops. And for the first time in my life, I made the connection. And I thought, here I am about to prosecute somebody for cruelty to this little pig. What on earth must have the little pig have gone through who I am about to eat? So that was the end of eating mammals. But I still ate other animals. And someone took me out to a birthday celebration in Philadelphia to this fancy lobster restaurant. And they bought two live lobsters or four live lobsters, however many of there were, on a big platter. And I had to choose which one I wanted. And they wiggled their antennae at me. They can't speak. They can't say anything. And it didn't register. At least I didn't think it did. And I chose the lobster. They said, broiled or boiled? I didn't know then. If you, call, if you say broiled, which I did, they cut the live lobsters back open, put salt, butter, pepper, and stick them under the grill. But when it came back, the lobster dish to my table, something had registered. And when I put that first bite in my mouth, I just burst into tears. And I realized that lobster had been trying to communicate in the only way that he knew. But it took that, the life of that animal, to wake me up. Then, I was, um, I've skipped your snails, haven't I? Did, did the snail come up? Look at this cute snail. <laughs> With a stick in his mouth. I used to eat snails. I can't cook. Nobody eats my food, which I'm so glad that there are now so many vegan carryouts. But I thought, any idiot can cook snails, because that's what the man in the Italian grocery store told me. He had a big barrel of live snails. And he said, all you do is, you, and you put a scoop in a, in a brown paper bag, you take them home, you put them in a pot of water, you put the lid on the pot so they can't get out. And the next morning, you drain the pot, and you put the dead snails in a saucepan or a little frying pan with some white wine, some garlic, and some oil. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I was driving home up into the countryside, not a soul around. And I had the feeling I was being watched. And I thought, that's odd. And I looked over, and there on the passenger seat was the pa paper bag of snails I had bought. And they had all worked their way up to the top. And they had worked the bag top open. And they were all on the edge of the back just hanging on, looking at me. So, of course, they all went to the bottom of the garden and were liberated. <laughs> that probably broke a federal law, but I think the statute of limitations has run. <laughs> the next thing that happened is just after Peter had started, um, Henry Spiro was a wonderful activist, and he started a campaign to ban the Dreze test, which is where chemicals are put in rabbits' eyes. But nobody really thought this was a very big thing, just thought there was the one test. And I was out driving in Maryland one weekend, and here was this, this was before the days of high security, there were these two barns, and they had these curious temperature control mechanisms on top of them. And outside were some animal cages. And I thought, what's that? So I went up to the barns, and there were no windows in them. But under the big double door, there was a hole, a, a, a gap. So I was able to lie down and look through the gap into the barn. And as far as you could see, all the way to the end of the barn were cages with rabbits in them in inhalation devices. And I knew then from looking at who these people were that cosmetics were tested on animals. And that's when we started our campaign 
and we said to everybody, look in your bathroom cabinet, look in your kitchen cabinet, throw everything out that has been tested on animals. And people did. Companies said, oh no, you have to test on animals for cosmetics. It's required by law. And we looked at thousands of pages of law and found, oh no, it's not required by law. And we were finally able to mobilize people to protest and to say, stop the animal tests. And today, 2,500 companies and counting don't use any animal tests for cosmetics. <laughs> I also thank my lucky stars for the man who challenged me when I put condensed milk in my tea. And he said to me, you don't eat veal, do you? And I said, of course I don't eat veal. We haven't eaten veal in my household since before I was a vegetarian. And he said, well, you know, there's a piece of veal in every glass of milk. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the only reason that you're able to drink that milk is because they've taken the calf away and put him in the veal crate so you could steal the milk meant for him. So I thank him, and I thank everybody who woke me up and said, there's another way to do this. So teaching other, anim other people about animals is vital. How do we do it? How do we get a life, as Vivian Westwood said? How do we do things? You can do what DXE does, yes. <laughs> or you can do what this man does, which I adore. That wakes people up. Or you can do this, protest Hermes for the use of exotic animals for skins. Or you can bear witness like this, Anita. <laughs> We started a whole movement, one person, just one person at first, all by herself out there, sometimes at night as the trucks were coming in. Maybe you can raise money for billboards like this. Or use stickers. Why do I say or and use stickers? Or design something like a food or vegan shoes. Or you can go into the bull ring and dance with the matadors and confront them like this man. <laughs> or you can go into classrooms and teach children because, gosh, I don't want them to grow up like my generation. This is Ellie, our mechanical elephant, whose ears flap and Priyanka Chopra is her voice and she talks to the children about why they should never go to the circus. Take vegan gifts to baby showers and birthday parties and what have you. And if someone asks, what do you want for your birthday or for the holidays or anything, I suggest you say, I want you to go vegan, yeah. even if it's for two weeks. <laughs> we have to use, use, use our social media and post videos. A lot of people are timid about doing that. I interview a lot of job applicants and I always look at their social media and I think, I don't know how much you care because you're not posting a lot about the number one issue that we have to tell everybody about, the biggest abuses on the face of the earth. Talk to people in the grocery line. Captive audiences are wonderful in the elevator in the grocery line. You got them, they're stuck. They have to listen to you. <laughs> When you're out jogging or walking, wear slogan shirts. Use bumper stickers if you have them. Be like Mike Leeming. Does anyone know Mike Leeming's story? Yeah. For those of you who don't, he walked up to two fishermen who had just pulled um, a fish out of the water. And he talked to them quite honestly about what was wrong with this? And they said, well, you're harassing us, or something like that. And he said, well, you're harassing the fish. And when they wouldn't listen to him, Mike just bent down and picked up the fish, who was still breathing, was freshly caught, and threw him back in the water. <laughs> that fish was a person. So there is a tipping point. 
It used to be that you risked arrest if you broke the window on a car, for example, to get a dog out who was stuck in the heat there and in trouble. Today, laws are being changed all over the country to allow people specifically to break the window and to go into the car and get the dogs out. Yeah. It only happens because of agitation. Today, laws allow people, or one day, laws will allow people to go into chicken farms and pig farms and take out sick and injured and dying animals. It just happened in Germany. There was a case of somebody going into a pig farm and taking um, the, several pigs out. And the farmer sued the activist. This went to court. And the lower court decided that the activists were all right. They, nothing was going to happen to them. The farmer then appealed this case, the, the decision was just out this month, to a higher court. And the higher court confirmed the decision to throw out the charges against the activists who'd taken the pigs. But the exciting part to me is this. The judge said, the goal of the accused was the welfare of the animals. They did exactly what was necessary and what was available as the mildest means. The judge said, if state institutions do not do their work as they should, the intervention of citizens is necessary. <laughs> German courts, one day U.S. courts will say those kinds of things, or better yet, perhaps there won't be any farms at all where we'll have to go and get animals out. I always believed in my lifetime that elephants would be out of the circus. I really held that conviction, and people would often say, no, 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 it's not going to happen. Well, Ringling first took the elephants off the road, and then, as you know, it closed down completely. <laughs> and what is happening from all over the world, from Bolivia to Ireland and state to state, almost every week we have a new victory in a county or a state, is that animal circuses are being banned completely, going out of business. Experimentation is another area that's very dear to my heart and I hope to everybody's heart here. At PETA we have 19 full-time scientists in all manner of um, areas of expertise and they're fighting to replace the use of animals in experiments. The rock that we started chipping away at back in 1980 has been very, very resistant Science doesn't think that anybody should have the nerve to tell them what to do, or at least that's how it was. But every month now, we stop some hideous animal experiment and we place, replace those animals with non-animal tools and research methods. So that's happening. But this month, at the University of Adelaide, they came up with a new research method to study tumors. And what they had done, for as long as you can imagine, is that they had grown tumors in mice, and then they had excised the tumors and examined them for cancer. And that process took years. They have just announced that they're now growing cancerous tumors on sponges, not the ones in the ocean, the ones you make. Not on mice, not on any animal, but on sponges. And in California this year, at one of the universities of California, they announced they have grown a human brain in a petri dish with six layers of cerebral cortex. And they didn't do it from animal cells. They did it from the cells of human tissue from discarded human teeth. So we chip away at the rock, and one day the rock cracks, and things happen, all because of activism. So let me end by offering five obvious, probably, ideas, but worth maybe repeating.
The first is please always remember you're important and you're powerful and you have a mighty, mighty voice. When I wrote One Can Make a Difference, every single person in that book had one thing that they held in common with each other, is that they never gave up. They were one person who decided they were going to do something, and they did. The late activist, Wangari Matai, tells a story of how when a forest was on fire, a little hummingbird would go back to the river and get water in her beak and come and douse the fire and get water in her beak and douse the fire. And she never said, you know, how small am I? She thought, what I can do, I can contribute to this thing. So no matter how small or how powerless we may feel sometimes, and everybody does, great change comes from the very smallest of actions, and we should never forget. Number two is never ever succumb to timidity. Don't be timid. What's the worst that can be done to you? What is the worst anyone can do to us? No one's going to pull our toenails out with a pair of pliers. No one's going to throw us in a dungeon. Someone might say some harsh words to us. So what? Who cares? We can cope with that. Every chance we get to act, we have to act. Every chance we get to say something, we have to say something. We have to show that we're the kind of people we believe ourselves to be. Third, is please don't ever let hateful remarks upset or depress you. Don't dwell on them. They're just a fact of life. In Virginia Beach, where the Peter headquarters is nearby Virginia Beach, um, someone, the park came out and they killed 75 beautiful, beautiful geese because their droppings were inconvenient. And there was a march that next Saturday of people who said there were better ways to handle this, there were more humane w ways to deal with this. And the people marched around the geese's home, the lake, and um, just talked to people. And I looked at the internet and um, people wrote on the internet, these trolls wrote, so what if the geese are killed? God gave humans dominion over the animals. These people, what have they got to do that they have nothing more important to carry out on their Saturday? And let's deliver the guano to these people's homes. And I wondered how on the God bits, at least, that Christians squared bullying and slaughtering with the separation of families and the taking of life. Those two didn't seem to me to be equal on the scale. God said, their God said, God is love and blessed are the merciful. And yet here we have Christian trolls taking down these people. How droppings left by birds was somehow a bigger issue for them than a simple entreaty to be kind, to be compassionate. But really, it doesn't matter because hateful words are just words. In the end, they're just words in the wind. And it doesn't matter how many hateful words you hear. You know what's right in your heart. And that's what you're going to do. It can't be allowed to distract us. Fourth, please help people change as much as you can by not only facilitating, but by being firm with them. And what I mean by that is if someone moans that it's too hard to be vegan, or it's too hard to do this, that, or the other. I often use what the composer Philip Glass said. Someone said to him, it's hard sometimes to find good shoes made of leather. And he said, yes, perhaps, but it's a lot harder for the animals if you don't. And that's our moral obligation, is to challenge people to do what they can do. And finally, five, is that human beings will always disagree and human beings are fallible and they're imperfect. So please try very hard not to fall out with each other. But if you do, please try very hard to do it with respect and to treat each other as the people that you care about. Because we are all in this together. 
And even if we disagree on some things, we have a very common base, and that is we are all out to do something for animals, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing no one can ever take away from us. I will leave you with one final thought, which is you are everything to the animals. You are the animal's only hope, their only voice, their ambassador. You're everything, everything, everything to them. If we don't do it, who will do it? Nobody. Your good deeds are so vital. Human beings only have so much they can do, but when compared to the other animals, we are gods, and we need to use that power with all our hearts, with all our might, with all our energy, as much as we possibly can. And here's a video that I think sums up everything I've said, and then I'll leave you in peace. We are all the same in all the ways that matter. It doesn't matter what we look like, how old we are, what language we speak, or who we love. It doesn't matter if we have fur, or feathers, or fins, the length of nose, or the number of legs. We're not different in any important way. We all have thoughts and feelings. We all feel love and pain and loneliness and joy. We can all understand, but we are not always understanding. We experience ourselves as separate from the rest but none of us deserves to be treated with less respect. Our task must be to break free from prejudice and to see ourselves in everyone else.